This podcast does not provide medical advice. Please listen to the complete disclosure at the end of the recording. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Everybody Dies. No, it's not everybody. It's everyone. Everyone dies. The podcast. I'm Marianne Manso. Potato, and I say <laughs> potato. Oh, hi. And I'm. Hang on. I need to look at my notes. Charlie Navarrete. <laughs> so grab your adult beverage of choice. Um, I don't know what time of day you're listening to this, but get yourself something to drink. Get yourself something sweet, as long as you're not a diabetic. Relax and enjoy spending the next hour with Charlie and I. We're going to offer some insights into what has been learned from people who are at the end of their lives. And later in our third half, we're going to be drinking with death. Mm. So, Charlie, I heard that you yeah. have a three-way chocolate mousse that you're going to seduce us with today. Listen, that rumors about that three-way. There's no video. There's no... Oh, oh, the dessert. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, uh-huh. Yes. So, today's recipe is triple chocolate shortcut mouse. Uh, mousse, mousse. Let's try that again. Triple chocolate shortcut mousse. What's better than one kind of chocolate? Three. Dark and white chocolate plus crunch chocolate chip cookie crumbles. Lomas's whip chocolate simple ganache. Ganache? Ganache. 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 Ganache or ganache? ganache. You say potato and I say. Oh, let's call the whole thing off. (laughs) So, Lomas's whip chocolate simple ganache folded into whipped cream tastes as decadent as mousse without the step of making creme anglaise. 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 I really need to go back to language school. Uh, making creme <laughs> as anglaise. Or, or to start language school, one or the other. So, uh, Sandy's going to upload this re- recipe. Uh, please go to the everyonedies.org website. That's every, the number one, dies.org. And send us your own death by chocolate recipes to share with others. Also, we appreciate your questions, jokes, and anything else you want to tell us. Thank you for that. I had to pick that because it had all those fancy words in it, and I didn't know how to say any of them. Yeah, thanks. Very kind. I was looking forward to hearing Mm -hmm. how you said them. (laughs) I do get my pleasures in odd ways. Mm Mm-hmm. So I thought what we would do is spend actually the next three episodes uh, talking about a book, and it'll be our special book club. And the book is called The Five Invitations, and it's by Frank Ostaskowski, and I'll have um, Sandy put the link to it, but the last name is O-S-T-A-S-E-S-K-I. A uh, good Italian guy. And uh, the book is Discovering What Death Can Teach Us About Living Fully. And so let's talk about what we can learn from people who are at the end of life. Now, as I thought about this, I thought, well, you know, we read, I, I, mean, I know when I got pregnant, you know, I, I read parenting books and um, because People who've had children and successfully or maybe unsuccessfully raised their children, they had insights. They had things that they could teach me about how to be a better mother. And um, as my girls grew older, you know, I've, I've read books about, you know, parenting, you know, adult daughters, because that's really different than parenting girl daughters, you know. So I've had to or I've taken the approach of, well, what do other people have to teach me about this role that I have? Or, you know, when I was in nursing school reading Notes on Nursing by Florence Nightingale, she was a nurse. She could help me understand about, well, what's my role when I'm working as a nurse? Florence Nightingale was from, I mean, from the 1800s, right? Yes, but she was... what What did you take away from that? Well, she was the first, um, you know, she she brought in the, the idea of actually educating 
nurses and, and what's our role. And for example, her principles are about cleanliness and fresh air to uh, help people get well. And those are, I mean, those are simple principles, but those are principles that weren't in effect um, in the day and age when she was practicing nursing. And Mm. um, people died, you know, from diseases that had to do with um, unsanitary conditions. Right. Right. Yeah. I remember, uh, for example, like doctors for what, ever? Until I think it was also the 1800s, somebody hit upon the idea: maybe I should wash my hands between patients. Yes, you know, between surgeries yes. or even between surgeries, wash my hands. Or yeah, just you know, like when I come in the door. So th- I mean, those are the pr- those are the principles of Florence Nightingale, and about caring. You know, she had a lot to a lot to write about caring because that wasn't. You know, but there were no professional nurses really before her. So she's really the mother of nursing. So right. if we want to learn about life and about the end of life, it would make sense that we would talk to people who are facing the end of life because it's really easy when we're healthy and moving around to say, um, you know, like you'll hear, you'll hear people or those who rem- who remember um, Jack Kevlorki and oh well, you know, if I ever get that sick, just take me out in the sh- in the field and shoot me because I wouldn't want to live that way. And I always kind of chuckle in my head when I hear people say that because when I was in grad school at UMass Boston, I was involved in a research study. You know, because those, that was kind of the heyday of Kevlorki and at that time. And I was involved in a research study where we, uh, my job as a research assistant was to go and talk to people who had been diagnosed with serious illnesses and talk to them about their, their feelings about end of life and, and dying and death. And those people would not in any way, shape, or form say, take me out in the field and shoot me because I'm really, really sick. So what did they say? say, Oh, sorry. Life life is so precious. Every minute, every second is so precious that it would have to take something really serious, like like intractable suffering and pain to make me want to end it sooner. So our viewpoint is very different when facing a serious illness and when we're perfectly healthy and, you know, thinking what we think we would say. So Frank, Frank O, let's just call him Frank O. We know we're talking about Ostaskowski. Well said. Um, Yeah, go ahead. He says, we know that we will die. Yet we spend much of our lives trying very hard not to think about it. But is it wise to ignore death? Could we live better if we spent more time thinking about our own mortality? Yeah, so but Franco, when you say spend, I'm sorry, but when you say spend time thinking about it, I mean, I mean, big contemplation, or I mean, what, what? So. That's a quote from from Franco. Okay. So let's talk about, like, what does he mean by that? So Franco is a a Buddhist teacher. He's the author of The Five Invitations, um, What Death Can Teach Us About Us Living Fully. So what the author offers is insight into the fact that life and death go together. Everyone is born and everyone dies. He says that we can't truly live unless we are aware of death. In his hospice work, he's been with many people facing the end of their lives. And in this book, um, he discusses what he learned. And so what I thought we would do is that we would talk about what he learned in talking to people, because how often do we have uh, large numbers of of dying people or very sick people that we can say, oh, here's what I learned. You know, I've, I've worked as a hospice nurse. I've, I've 
been with many people at the end of their life. But how many people really have that opportunity to learn from these people? Is that a rhetorical question or are we talking about now with so many people dying from the virus, from coronavirus? Yeah, but even though people are dying from the coronavirus, the nurses are with these people, but nobody else is because nobody else is allowed into the hospital. Mm. And it's very different to to die from an acute illness in a matter of a couple of, of days to weeks than it is to be with somebody who's in hospice care who's dying over the course of a few months. So acute illnesses and acute deaths are very different than um, the population that Frank O was taking care of because he was in hospice. So um, the five invitations is a meditation on the meaning of life and how maintaining an ever-present consciousness of death can bring us closer to our truer selves. I mean, think about it, Charlie. If we're living as though every day is a gift, as if every day could be our last day, we're going to make different choices than if we live as though I have an infinite number of tomorrows. Oh, I'll do that tomorrow. I'll do that tomorrow. I'll do that tomorrow. That's a whole different way of living as opposed to saying when your spouse or lover or even your kids leave the house. Or your spouse's that you lover. Say, yeah. That you say, I love you or I really appreciate you because you don't know if that's the last time that you're going to get to say that to them. Where if you say, well, I'll just tell them tomorrow. Well, what if tomorrow never comes? That's a whole different viewpoint. I have a little thing that I, a little plaque that I have in my office that says every day is a gift. And I really try to live that way, that every day is a gift to me. Um, These five invitations show us how to wake up fully to our lives. They become understood as, as sort of best practices for anybody who's coping with loss or navigating any sort of transition or crisis. They guide us toward appreciating life's preciousness. Awareness of death can be a valuable companion on the road to living well. Help us have a rich and meaningful life and letting go of regret. So this book offers an essential wisdom from people who are dying. And what I'd like to do is look at the five invitations and maybe you guys can start to consider how you're going to apply these principles in your own life and begin to embrace the truth that everyone does die. I think that sometimes when people look at our podcast name, they're not quite sure what to make of us. We mean, everyone dies. What do you mean by that? It's like, I mean, everyone dies. It's, there's, not, there's not a thing that is ever alive that doesn't at some point die. That's just the way it is, right? Yeah, there's times when, um, actually a lot of times, you know, we, we, we get together, you know, now on Zoom, and someone said, you know, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? And I mentioned, well, I'm a co-host of a, of a new podcast called Everyone Dies. And the reaction is runs the gamut from, you know, laughter to, oh, my God, my so-and-so <laughs> just died or my so-and-so is sick or of course now in these times people worry about dying and breathing it's yeah it, it just you know people just interpret it in 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 different ways but no one is, ever tells you to shut up no one ever you know no one ever tries to change the subject with me uh, just immediately everyone has a reaction and some people just launch into um, you know, a story, some, some some funny, some sad, but even even if it's not conscious of what you're saying, that we just need to make it more conscious, it is always somewhere in the back of someone's mind. I think it's elevated now more because of the coronavirus, but yeah, it always gets a reaction. Yes. 
Yep. And what I would love is for there to be the reaction of, yes, that's true. And I'm living my life differently now that I've acknowledged and embraced my mortality. Now, I know maybe I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only but one. Oh, um, shoot, you beat me too. <laughs> <laughs> I win. <laughs> mm, right. It's not about winning. Go ahead. It's about how you play the game. Yeah. So what are these five invitations? They are, number one, don't wait. Number two, welcome everything. Push away nothing. Number three, bring your whole self to the experience. Number four, find a place of rest in the middle of things. And five, cultivate don't know mind. Now, we're going to talk about every one of them. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, before you do, what was the last one, please? Don't what? Cultivate don't know mind. And oh, don't. That's okay. No, don't know. Mike. I don't know. Got it. Okay. I don't know. Don't know. So we're going to spend this podcast plus two more um, on these invitations. And, oh, that, um, and that goes perfectly with the with the dessert, triple chocolate. Shrewd, good planning. Whoa, okay. the method to my madness. Mm -hmm. So the first one. So today we're just going to talk about the first one, which is don't wait. Uh, so the first invitation, um, Frank O writes that instead of, no, this is a quote, instead of pinning our hopes on a better future, we focus on the present and become grateful for what we have in front of us right now. We say, I love you more often because we realize the importance of human connection. We become kinder, more compassionate, and more forgiving. Don't wait is a pathway to fulfillment and an antidote to regret. So, as I said, he um, worked in a hospice in um, California. And in the beginning of Don't Wait, he writes about um, somebody who... Uh, this guy, Jack, who was a heroin addict for 15 years, lived in his car, and um, he was diagnosed with lung cancer and was living in the Zen Hospice Project in um, California. And Jack kept a journal, and in his journal he wrote, Over the years, I've put things off. I figured there was plenty of time later on. At least I've managed to do one major project. I finished that training to be a motorcycle mechanic. Now they tell me I have less than six months. I'm going to fool them. I'm going to make it longer than that. Ah, who am I kidding? To tell the truth, I'm scared, angry, tired, and confused. I'm only 45 years old, and I feel like I'm 145. I have so much that I want to do, and now there isn't even time to sleep. And that's that whole idea of don't wait. Like, we think... Oh, I've always wanted to do, I don't know, fill in the blank for yourself. And we think, well, later, I, I'll do that later. But it's an assumption that we're going to have a later. It's an assumption that we're going to be well enough. When, when I was 61, I started to plan my retirement because I could retire at 62. And people said, oh my God, you're too young to retire. And I thought, yeah, that's great, right? Because <laughs> I want to be able to scuba dive. I want to run around with my husband and travel. And yeah, I didn't know about coronavirus, but that's another story. You know, I want to be able to actually walk through an airport and, you know, carry my scuba tanks and, and do stuff. I don't want to wait until, I don't want to take the chance that I'll break a hip or break a something and I won't be able to do these things. And I'll, and I don't want to look back and say, shit, 
I should have retired when I was 62 when I could. And instead of waiting for, you know, an extra percentage or something in my, in my retirement pay. I mean, I made a conscious choice about, I'm not freaking waiting. And was that a good choice? Well, now, you know, I'm, I'm quarantined, but I'm quarantined with my wonderful husband in, in, you know, at the lake. So, and I get to do this podcast. So I have no regrets about that either. It's not exactly what I had planned, but it's okay. You know? So, um, honestly, it's from living, uh, contributing to, um, not waiting for something. You know, my dad died when I was 15 years old and I learned that, um, you know, like he would say, well, when Marianne gets older, when uh, she graduates from high school, we'll be able to do this, we'll be able to do that. Well, he died when I was a freshman in high school and he didn't get a chance to do the things that he said he was going to do. And from that lesson, I learned not to put things off that that tomorrow wasn't guaranteed. And if I felt strongly about wanting to do it, I, I did it. Also working in hospice and palliative care and listening to regrets of people who waited and the time got missed and the cancer came and the cancer wasn't something that they were planning on. And so the plans that they had made, they weren't going to be able to do. Are there things, Charlie, even in, in your life, what, what are you waiting to say or do or be in your life? Is there anything you're waiting for? Actually, waiting for, no, because, but I mean, this was years in the making, where I stop, what, what's that phrase? You stop and smell the roses? Um, mm -hmm. It's it's interesting you're saying that because a couple of days ago I heard on a radio program with everything you know and of course it was related to the to the virus um, and someone said um, you know the phrase you know take a breath you know relax calm down take a breath and um, the the guest on the program said okay but when you say that actually take the breath realize you are taking a breath realize you're breathing out otherwise it's just some quick little idiom some phrase and but you're not actually doing it mm -hmm. even something simple something as simple as take a breath take it you know be in that moment take that breath so that with with me you know, I used to make lists. Oh, I want to do that. I want to do that. And then I realized, yeah, this, this list is getting just a bit too long. So it's basically, okay, I would like to do one, two, and three. I, I never have more than three things at a time. And then I do it. Mm -hmm. um, there's never a, a, a matter of, oh, when I find the time, I, I don't find the time. So maybe I'll wake up an hour earlier. Or I won't watch, you know, <laughs> uh, an ep, you Tiger know, King. Several episodes. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I read, I read, I, you know, I tried watching that a little bit. I just don't see the appeal to it. Um, and, oh, you and, gotta, and, you gotta kind of get yeah. past the first episode. You, you know, you know what it was. I heard it. You gotta meet. I, you gotta meet Carol Baskin. You gotta meet Carol Baskin, and then. If you want to stop after that, go ahead. But I think get to that part. Oh God, homework. Um, so I, <laughs> I, I think what it was the first I really heard about this. I was listening to um, um, to an interview of a fresh air, a fresh air. And Terry, do Gross, you guys see how easy it is to derail Charlie from whatever it is he's talking about? Go ahead, Charlie. I'm sorry. What was I saying? So uh, about um, <laughs> and fresh air and. Um, I don't remember the the gentleman's name, but he he was on it. I guess he's the, the star of it or something. I I and I just I don't know. I just found nothing appealing about him. So I yeah I, I began to watch 
I, I, I really, I'm in, in all fairness, I only watched about the first 10 or 15 minutes of the first no, episode. No, that's and, not um, enough. It's not enough. All right. Fine. Um, but to that point, getting back to what you originally said, um, yeah, so this, if there's if there's something I want to do, I will make the time for it. Um, and if something, I don't know, life gets in the way, um, I have to work extra or you know, something comes up, I just learn to stop beating myself up because I, I didn't do it or I didn't mm-hmm. do it as well as I had intended or I didn't spend as much time as I wanted or I could do this better. Just like, you know what? Yeah, back when I was in college, I could have done this better too instead of going down that rabbit hole. You know, I remember the thing about take a breath, but then take the time to take the breath. Don't just use it as a phrase. So that. Mm-hmm. That's what I do. Good. This, this is what I want to do, and I'll do it. And I don't beat myself up if it's not done in a timely fashion or the way it, quote, should be done. It's like, it's just the opposite. It's not like, it's not about what I didn't do, but what I actually did. That. That's a good way to live. So, and Frank also talks about that change is constant and inevitable. Uh, we did the podcast about the new normal and talking about how to adapt. And we may not want to change, but we need to change in order to live our best lives. <coughs> Excuse me. So the, another part of what um, Franco talks about is that hope is an innate human quality that can positively contribute to the sense of wellness. Mature hope requires both a clear intention and simultaneously letting go. How can you be open to an outcome without being attached to the specific result? It's like saying you want to go to eat and being happy with White Castle as opposed to being in a four-star restaurant. So it's like, what's the outcome you want? And you know, you want to eat, right? That's your outcome. Um, this, the specific result is, well, are you really saying you want to eat at a four-star restaurant or you yeah, just want to eat? You just want to but, fill your tummy. Well, but when you have that crave, you know, you, you, you hit Whitey Castell. Yes. Well, or be very which I, clear Which I believe that- is, is celebrating its 100th anniversary no, is it next year? God, oh. I think I think next year is one hundred years of White Castle. Seriously, I've been Seriously. going there for a hundred years. Yes, you little witch. Yes. Oh, I thought it was a vixen. Damn. <laughs> so, so thinking about this, 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 there is a story about Mother Teresa. Mm-hmm. And did she you know, go to she White was, Castle? You know, if she ate cows, I bet she would have. But anyway, yeah. so she was in India, well, in Calcutta. Well, can't be perfect. Yeah. You know, and she took care of people who were at the end of their lives. And a reporter once asked her, Mother Teresa, how do you stand it? How do you take care of these sick and dying people day after day after day after day? And she said, you know, it's not the fact that they're sick and dying. She said, I have one goal for them. My goal is that everybody that I take care of has a good and comfortable death. She said, I'm not trying to keep them from dying. You know, everyone dies. She didn't say that part, but I'm saying everyone dies. She's saying, the people that I take care of have a good and a comfortable death death. So her outcome is a good and comfortable death. Her, her result is not that, you know, everybody's cured and that nobody dies. And she was very happy because she met her goal every single time. The yeah. people she, t- yeah. she cared for had a good and comfortable death. And so we need to, I think, 
you know, take a look at our lives and saying, what is it that we really want? You know, do, do, does it require a ton of money that justifies our working 90 hours a week? What is it that we really want? There's also the, oh, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Um, uh, just listening, you know, like, you know, again, just, you know, different programs or, or, or talking with friends here. Um, there's there's a, a, a lot of that. It's, it's, you know, people are taking time to reflect. But I've, I've noticed, too, because m most most of my friends are, you know, what was considered, you know, uh, middle class, upper middle class, steady employment, um, have a little money put away. Some, some have more money put away. Not, I mean, this whole virus and shutting down, you know, businesses, I mean, they understand it's with some, you know, it's going to start hurting the, you know, the, the bottom line soon. But I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm too pessimistic. But I wonder, will will what you are speaking of? You know, taking time to think about what you really want, because you know many people are are doing that. Is that going to last? It's. It just seems that people just have a short memory, and they get caught up into what I don't know what society expects. What. Um, you know, get back into into their into their routine, um, afraid to try something new, so they just fall back into the familiar. Um, so I, I think that that thought is happening now a lot. But I don't know. In the in the long run, you know, are we are we going to stay to that? Are we going to stick to that and and find something for ourselves? And it doesn't. And, it, and well, again, doesn't his that, history yeah, would suggest yeah. that that's not going to happen. You know, it's like we go through a crisis. And you think, well, are we going to learn from this? Or what are we going to learn from this? And it, you're right. It'll be interesting to see if people, you know, continue to play the board games with their children and continue to garden with their children. And I was at Lowe's yesterday, and I always have to go through the plant section. And there, God, there were a lot of people at Lowe's. But there were people with children who were you know, letting the kids pick out seeds to plant and that kind of thing. And I thought, I don't remember seeing this previous years, you know, where the kids were involved in the gardening. But I thought, I like this. And I hope next year those same parents are letting the kids pick out seeds, you know? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. We'll see. But I think that that goes to what you're saying, right? Yes. Yes, it does. So Franco also talks about forgiveness, and forgiveness has many benefits. And he says that um, forgiveness is like setting down a hot coal we've been carrying in our hand. And there's obstacles to forgiveness. We we have our pride, you know. We have our well, she shouldn't have done that, or he shouldn't have done that, but. Are we really needing to be right? Are are we are we really thinking that we're so strong and so invincible that we can't learn to be humble? Yes. And ask but to be on. forgiven. <laughs> 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 that we can't ask to be forgiven when we make mistakes. Not 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 that, not, not not me, of course, but people I've heard of. Go on. Yes. Yeah, yeah, other people. Um you yeah. know, mistakes are part of our humanness and that vulnerability and think about I, I've done assignments with my students when I was teaching about if you had a year left to live, what would you do? You know, what would be different? And I've had so many of them. I had one girl talk about, you know, I don't even remember now what her father did to their family but she was angry. She was angry with him and she wasn't in a relationship with him anymore. But she wrote that if she had a year left to live, that she would talk and reconcile with her father. And I said to her, you don't know that you don't have a year left to live. If, if that's important, then what's keeping you 
from going to talk to your dad and to forgive him. And I don't know, it was maybe six weeks, eight weeks later, she came back to me in tears and she said, you know, I thought about what you said and I went and I had dinner with my dad and I forgave him. And she said, and I just heard he had a heart attack and died. Jeez. You know, over that. Wow. You know, so she had her assignment. She went and she did have dinner with him. Had, you know, like maybe a month, six weeks after that, he dropped dead. And she said, I am so glad that you asked me that question. What was keeping me from forgiving him? Because, you know, I, I, I say often on the show, dead is dead. Right. You don't get do-overs. Once her dad died, all she had would be the rest of her life of saying, I should have forgiven him. I, I, I should have done that. But once that person's dead, you, you, you can't. I mean, you can symbolically do it. You can write a letter. There's other ways that, that you can symbolically do it, but to actually be able to do it, you no. can't. It's gone, yeah. So we, you know, living is sort of a precarious situation. You know, it's an unstable situation. We don't know what's around any next corner. We don't know when you're going to walk down the stairs and fall. You don't, I mean... There's just, I've heard so many stories in my 45 years as a nurse of like, holy crap, you know, like all the stuff that can go wrong, that sort of embracing that precariousness, not in a way that keeps us, you know, locked in the house so that we never, ever go out, but more of, I'm so grateful for this moment, you know, if um, my husband will do something for me and I'll say, Thank you so much for that. And he kind of looks at me oddly like, you don't have to thank me for that. But I want him to know how incredibly grateful I am to him for for the things that he does. And mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, if he's going to go for a run and never make it back. You know, the coyotes might get him, the cougars, whoever it is that's out there. Jeez, you know? <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're rural. <laughs> But the thing is that you want, I want to make sure he knows that I appreciate him. And, you know, maybe we need to be taking a look at our lives and not wait. So um, our next podcast, we're going to talk about the second and third invitations, which is welcome everything and push nothing away. And um, bring your whole self to the experience. So those are the two that we'll talk about in um, the next podcast. Literally, push nothing away. You don't. You don't. You don't. You don't, you don't, you don't give. You don't need to give me you know, details. I I look forward to this. But yeah, as soon as you said, push nothing away. Uh, You're thinking about that plate of pasta or what? Oh, no, I would not push that away, no. See? Push nothing away. But what about someone and, with a toxic personality? Well, that's a different thing, huh. which we'll talk about in our next podcast. Same um, bat time. Say, oh, sorry. Wrong wrong. Guy. Exactly, wrong, right? Wrong, wrong series. Mm -hmm. um, so please take a look at our additional resources Um for this podcast on the webpage, everyonedies.org with one, the number one, everyonedies.org. And if there's topics that you would like us to discuss, um, you can email us at mail at everyonedies.org. And uh, we would be happy to take your ideas and answer your questions. And uh, we appreciate that. So in our third half, we're going to do a little day drinking with death in our um, recurring segment called Drinking with Death. Cheers. Salud. Nostrovia.
，呃，亲亲，干杯。<laughs> okay, you win. Good, because I that was the last one, and I know I know more, but that's my my mind is now blank. Hello, and welcome to our third half of Everyone Dies, and tonight we are drinking with death. And、uh, it's just been such a wonderful experience to meet different death entities.、Uh, this death entity, do you have a a name other than death that you want me to call you? No, death is fine. Well, then,、um, do you want to introduce yourself to our audience, or do you want to just go in and and start answering their questions? I think most people know of me. I doubt I need an introduction, so I think we can go right to questions. All right, Margaret from Oklahoma City wants to know why do you go around scaring people? That surprises me too. I've wondered for a long time why I am so scary, since everyone knows that death is inevitable. And that it will come for everyone. And over the years, I've bent over backwards to try and be less or unscary. There's lots of talk about death, and most importantly, about the the period before death and being ready and being comfortable and having your needs met. So, if something is inevitable, like paying taxes, it's just stunning to me that I'm scary because. I, do I sound scary to you? I don't think I'm scary to me. Well, you don't. You don't sound scary. So, what do you think it is that people are scared of? Well, I've reflected on that. The the one of the things that I find striking is that for most people now. Death doesn't come suddenly. It comes after an illness, of which they know the name, and which is generally known not to be curable. And they act surprised when it shouldn't have been a surprise. So I wonder if it isn't. You know, I observe pe- there are those people who plan, and there are those people who don't, and then they're surprised when something happens. And so that's about all I can make of it. It's the 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 people who don't plan in general in their lives. They're surprised when it's time to leave for、uh, to get in the car to go to an appointment, or they're surprised when it's time to go to the airport,、um, and they're surprised when I arrive. Do you think that people see death as an option? The, I I think that that's a coping skill I see. The I observe many people when they're frightened, they regress to earlier levels of development, so they behave more like children. And of course, children have all sorts of magical thinking.、Mm-hmm. Um, they think their mother is gone forever. When she all she does is go to the bathroom, and children start wailing and crying, and and she reappears. And I just went to the toilet, and I really wanted to go alone. Thank you. Then、um, they reappear, but but they grow up. They all right. There is mother's always there, whether she's in the bathroom or not, or whether she's at work.、Um, I I see some of that. The there is a regressed childlike quality. For some people, that helps them cope with their fear. Do you think it's different in different parts of the world? Now, I'm assuming that you don't have a specific territory. So, if if my assumption is wrong, please correct me. You're right. I I have a worldwide practice, and that's part of the fun of my role. Is I get to see human beings who are fundamentally the same, but. Their cultures differ enormously, and I'm struck by the cultures where there is much more disease, where death is frequently sudden and comes after a sudden illness, 
or a sudden accident, they cope better than the parts of the world where most of that has gone away. And people can live their lives as if death never happens. And I'm also struck by the power of marketing, which is a very focused communication. It, it's impressive to me in uh, the developed world, the, the rather simplistic messages, if you buy this, if you wear that, if you live in a certain place or go to a certain hotel, you'll be beautiful and young. Um, and the, the parts of growing up and being an adult and ultimately dying are portrayed as optional. But it does, it's, it, it is very childlike, or I think those ads appeal to the childlike magical thinking and it's fun as long as it's just a game, but no, um, the latest wrinkle cream will not make me look 20 years old again. It just, but it's amazing how much that marketing strategy sells cream. Well, do you think that we need a marketing strategy for our mortality or for death? I don't think there's anyone that is that doesn't agree that I won't come. The, the marketing strategy that I'd like to see is to maximize the time of living, that making it as worthwhile as possible. It's in some parts of the world, there's a uh, general approach that that living is is practicing for dying that you should live with the idea that you can die and therefore each day is shaped by maximizing that day and its potential and not waiting and holding holding back for some future time when they know they're dying the the, the maximizing what really matters each day is something I would see as needing to be marketed, at least in the developed world. So it's like uh, using the good china and the fine silver to eat your cereal. It's funny you bring that up, because that's, that's one of my pet um, pleasures. Um, I've, I've, I've always been struck by people saving the best things in their lives, the things that give them pleasure, whether it's parties, birthdays, celebrations, and waiting, and sometimes really depriving themselves when it could happen today. You could, if you enjoy eating on Pretty China, and I do, I like the whole, I like the linen tablecloths, the lots and lots of candles, why hold back? Mm -hmm. um, food, ta food tastes better when, when you dress up and, and when you set the table nicely, and people behave better. Why not do that all the time? So what what mentality is that? I know I my parents were depression era babies and everything was saved for another time and everything I can remember my father saying I was the youngest and my father saying, "Well, we're going to do this when Marianne gets out of school and we're going to get do this when, you know, when we don't have kids in the house anymore. And he died at 52 when I was, uh, was I a freshman in high school. And so I learned at 15 that there are really no guarantees for the future and that if you want to do something, you sure and heck better get it done because you could die at 52. So that's, I think that's profound. I'm of the homes that I visit where there are rooms where the furniture is encased in plastic and where nobody <laughs> goes because they're saving it for good. But that's never really defined because no day ever measures up to being good enough when they have beautiful things and beautiful rooms and this sense of, of 
living deprived or waiting, the, the waiting for something else as opposed to, oh, you have the ability to have beautiful furniture. Why not use it instead of um, other parts of the home that you think of are for every day? Well, every day can be a uh, can be glorious. There are, there are things about human beings and being with each other that are precious. And I would sure like to see more celebration of that. And when I arrive, there's, uh, I've, 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 I've seen people describe this as having your emotional bags packed. When everything that has been said that needs to be said, when, every, when there isn't a sense of deprivation or having held back, then those are the deaths where uh, people are ready to see me. They're not frightened. Some are actually quite relieved. And to me, those are the happiest deaths where there, there are no regrets. Well, Death, it has been great to have a drink with you tonight. And I really appreciate the, uh, the chat. So um, I'm going to say salute. And I will hopefully see you to talk with you again soon. I'd enjoy that. Thanks, Marianne. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, please stay tuned for future episodes of Everyone Dies. Our thanks to our executive producer, retired Major General David, our producer, Sandy, John, our technical advisor, and our friends, families, and our loyal listeners who are supporting our work at Everyone Dies. This is Charlie Navarrete. I'm Marianne Matzo. And we look forward to talking with you soon. Chin chin. We'll drink again. Don't know when. Someday. Don't know when. But of course we can do it virg- uh, <clears throat> virtually too. All right. See you all. This podcast does not provide medical advice. All discussion on this podcast, such as treatments, dosages, outcomes, charts, patient profiles, advice, messages, and any other discussion are for informational purposes only and are not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Always seek the advice of your primary care practitioner or other qualified health providers with any questions that you may have regarding your health. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard from this podcast. If you think you may have a medical emergency, call your doctor or 911 immediately. Everyone Dies does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, practitioners, products, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned in this podcast. Reliance on any information provided in this podcast by persons appearing on this podcast at the invitation of Everyone Dies or by other members is solely at your own risk.